So welcome, everybody. I'll let you all get settled in. OK, outside there's a, a sandwich board, a, bill, a little sign, and it says, Welcome Home. And the reason it says, Welcome Home, we are truly brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is our church family. So everybody, welcome home. Now, that sign is to be used for different events. It can be used only with dry erase markers. Like this Saturday, we're going to have a men's breakfast. So hopefully on Friday, it'll be set out by the road. And it'll say, men's breakfast, 8, 8 AM, all welcome. So any organization that needs to put a little display outside on the side street, wherever you want it, that sign's available to be used, OK? Also, um, I have the privilege this year to be chair of the elders. And need your prayers. We really need a lot of prayers. Uh, tomorrow night, we are meeting as elders. And our main focus will be, what is the vision of this church? Where do we see the church in three to five years? What, what effect are we going to have in our community around us? You know, these are, these are questions that the church should be asking and that we want to ask. And the, the, I don't know if people, everybody realizes, but the church members are divided into different lists. So it's called shepherd's lists. And that list is assigned to each elder. And due to the number of elders that we have, the list is quite long in each elder. So we have a responsibility of elders to reach out to the members on our list. But I'm going to ask the members of the congregation is find out who your elder is. Reach out to the elder and pray for your elder also. If you don't know who your elder is, contact the office or ask myself and, and I will get that information to you. Okay. Also, um, the men's sorry outreach is on uh, March 25th. And on the outreach, we picked the date March 25th, but we're going to give the people in the community a chance to join us for breakfast on Easter morning. But we're going to ask them to RSVP that by the, the 28th or 29th to give the people ordering the food time to prepare if there's people going to show up. Also, um, men's breakfast. The men's breakfast is focusing on, you know, God gave us each an identity. You know, I am Jack. There's other people here. Jack has certain talents and gifts. All of us have talents and gifts. But what is our purpose? What are we going to do with those talents and gifts? Why am I here in this church? Why am I here at this time? So this is what we, we're going to discuss at the man's breakfast. Who am I? Why am I here? And what am I doing here? So there's a little video I want you to see about the men's breakfast. Hi. Welcome to Who Am I? And what am I doing here? If you're like most people, you probably wondered about those big questions, the questions of who am I? What's my purpose in life? What's the meaning of all these things? That's what we're going to be exploring together. My name is Joel Bierman. I teach systematic theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Systematic theology usually raises some questions for most people. They ask me, what's that anyway? So I usually like to describe it as systematics is sort of like confirmation class on steroids because we talk about the basic teachings, the doctrines of God, and about how they relate to us in our lives. That's what I do when I teach my students. And what we'll be doing here over these next six sessions is talking about some doctrinal things, but applying them to our lives where we are. So many of these questions are very important to us, foundational questions. Who am I? What is my identity? What am I doing here? What's my purpose? What's my, my reason for being? These are the questions we need to explore together, and I'm looking forward to exploring them with you. We'll be beginning just shortly. Please join me and come along. So shortly is this Saturday, 8 AM. Come join us. Good morning, the Lord be with you. Well, first, you see me with mask is because I have a little bit of cold, okay? So I don't have C-19. I don't want you to be in panic attack, okay? So just a regular cold. You know, after coming from Florida, very hot uh, place there, 
and came here on Monday, and that was no good the weather. Well, you see what happened. So maybe I'm not going to go again to Florida. <laughs> I'm going to stay here in winter. OK, so today we are here to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to all of you. Welcome visitors who are with us the, this morning. So that's wonderful to have you here. Uh, today we celebrate the, in the Christian church the second Sunday in Lent. And we follow the order of service being printed for this occasion or on the monitors. Uh, Jack already announced a few things that we're going to be doing at Faith. I just want to, to mention that we're supposed to have coffee today, coffee hours, but we don't have uh, no one who do it. So, there is the coffee for yeah. okay, so I didn't get the message. Okay, <laughs> so maybe I was in Florida. Okay, so wonderful. Delete what I said. Okay, just forget. There is coffee after the service. That's wonderful. Uh, again, just to remind you, check your mailboxes because you, we have a staff there. We have the calendars for 2023 and other things. So you check it out and take those things with you. Um, other announcements? Oh, remember, next Sunday marks the beginning of daylight savings time. So you could do that on Saturday before you go into bed. And then Monday you'll be okay. So remember that. Uh, remember the midweek services that we have, Lenten services on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, March 8th at 7 p.m. here at Faith. You are welcome to participate, to come. And as well, the congregational meeting. We have a congregational meeting. will be held here at Faith on Sunday, March 19th, after the service. So all voters members and, and members who would like to be part of the voters uh, members uh, as a voter members to be here you could come and and we're gonna have it downstairs and we're gonna have a, a light snacks will, will be available and already Jack mentioned about for this week the elders meeting at 7 on Monday and as well there is a ladies Bible study at, on Wednesday at 10 a.m. so we should all the ladies are welcome to participate. Okay, so we are ready to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, this moment, let us uh, share to one another the peace of Christ. Peace of Christ to all of you. We begin our service. We begin our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We continue with our opening kids' song, See This Wonder in the Making. be seated. 
Okay, now we need the children to come forward. Where they are? Oh, the, you are the children of God. Come, come. You may be seated there. Okay, I'm gonna follow you. Uh, I still can do these things, but probably soon I'm not going to be able to do it. Anyway, so it's good to be here. How are you? Good? You okay? You okay? Yes, you're okay. So today we are going to talk about uh, a word that says to be born again. And I want the three of you to come here. Come here. I'm going to show you something here. Come here. Come. Here around. Around here. You see this one what we have here? Is where we put water there. Yes. When we uh, we baptize somebody, when you were babies, you were baptized. So we put water there. Okay? And then we say the word of God. We say your name in the word of God, and you were baptized. So there, come on, come here. You see, we put water there. Right now there is no water for sure. I'm just gonna show you. So we put water, and then when you baby, when you're a baby, you're crying, so not like that. So mom or dad take you, on their arms and put you here and we put water in God's word. So there, at that moment, you are born again. But what born again means? Well, let me tell you. Believe that Jesus is the son of God. So there, in your heart, in your heart there, there faith is put it. You see? And then you believe that Jesus is God's son. Second, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. You see? That's the reason that we have the cross. We, because the cross reminds us all the time what Jesus did for us on the cross. But there are more. That Jesus rose from the dead. When he died on the cross, he didn't stay there. There, he rose from the dead. And we believe that. And because of that, there's another thing that we have. We go to heaven to be in God's presence one day. And there is another thing that's very important. That's the Holy Spirit comes to live with us in our hearts. There. You see? We cannot see it. I cannot see the Holy Spirit there in each, any of the people here as well. But it's there. The Holy Spirit there to remind us all the time what Jesus did for us, that we are forgiven, that Jesus loves us, that he died for us, and that's wonderful, no? Yes, indeed. So that's how we are born again. So that's what it means, born again. So when we believe that, all that, is that we are born again. It's not wonderful? Yes, it's wonderful. Okay, so that's the message for you this morning, and I want you to pray with me and invite the members of the congregation as well to pray with me. And I want you to do like this. Okay, like this. Okay, close your eyes and repeat after me. Dear God, we praise you that in Jesus we are a new creation. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you for coming. Now I think that you're going to the Sunday school with the teacher. Follow your teachers. Over there, over there, here. Over there. Please rise.
We continue with the opening sentences. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, in you I trust. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. O God, our Father, we confess that by nature we are sinful, and that in our pride we have turned away from your commands. Forgive us, Lord, for all that we have thought and said and done that is contrary to your will and your ways. And forgive us for all those times when we have trusted in our own righteousness instead of relying on your grace in Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. Forgive us, Lord, for the times when we have not been good stewards of your great creation and for those times when we have been unwilling to help our neighbors as we ought. Brothers and sisters in Christ, upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your Holy Spirit soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ he who calls you is faithful he will surely do it Amen.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Oh God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. A great promise of God is made to Abram. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the Oak of Moreh. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The epistle is from Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8 and 13 through 17. The faith of Abraham who believed God is remembered. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, 
who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus teaches Nicodemus about being born again. Please rise to hear the Gospel. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is a spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it, with, where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, We speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We continue confessing the catechism part regarding the second article. In the second article of the creed, our confession is focused on Jesus, our Redeemer, who God in his love gave to bring us salvation and the promise of eternal life. We speak the words of the creed. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, through God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, Purchase and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead 
lives, reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. You may be seated. We continue with the sermon hymn. Dear friends in Christ, the, the Word of God, through which the Holy Spirit guides our hearts and minds today is recorded in the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, which was read before. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit who keep us together. Amen. Friends in Christ, if you spend any time learning about the Bible as a kid, whether in a Sunday school <coughs> classroom, or a Christian school, or even watching veggie tales, you probably heard the story about Zacchaeus. He ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Jesus, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And then you remember what happened? People got upset. Why did they get upset? Because apparently, Zacchaeus was a bad person. He was a tax collector. And he had gotten rich by cheating his own people out of their hard earned money. So understandably, they were shocked. They were scandalized that Jesus would go to stay at his house. But that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus does. 
he came to our house. And he and Zacchaeus hang out. And Zacchaeus has a change of heart. He changes his ways. He starts a new life. It is a memorable account about what Jesus came to do and how one unlikely individual responded to him in faith. Zacchaeus was a different man because of his encounter with Jesus. He was changed by the grace of God at work in his life. He repented and made amends to those he had hurt or harmed. And I believe it is fair to assume that the man who was ready to give so much to others was a man who knew the importance and the blessings of living day by day in a special relationship with the Lord of his life and the God of his salvation. I also believe that is what we see in Abraham in our text today. Every time we read the scripture, it is like a diamond shining with many different facets. And this time, as I read this text, the one thing that caught my attention is the fact that twice within this text, we are told that Abraham built an altar to the Lord. In total, when the Old Testament speaks of Abraham and God, in total there are four altars built by Abraham. Here in this text there are two. The experience of God's love and the assurance of his guidance and protection day by day move Abraham to respond in worship and praise. His faith and his worship were not just a Sunday morning thing. Abraham was a man who knew the grace of God in all of life and who responded to that grace day by day as he walked by faith with the Lord of his life and the God of his salvation. Do we make room in our lives day by day for the Lord of our lives? Do we rejoice day by day in the God of our salvation? Is God and our worship of him a daily part of our life? It so often seems that we take our faith for granted or that we only take it out to dust if off when we put on our Sunday cloth. But the rest of the week, in the midst of all the things that happen at work, at school, or wherever we may be, we often forget the God who is always with us, who always works in all things for our good. The God who has saved us by his grace is more often an afterthought than the center of our lives. But the psalmist says to us, 105 verse 6, look to the Lord in his strength, seek his face always, Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. All descendants, descendants of Abraham, his servant, all sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He's talking about us. Yes, we are descendants of Abraham, sons of Jacob. We are, you, me, those who have faith in Jesus Christ. As the spiritual descendants of Abraham, we are called upon to remember the Lord and like Abraham to take our faith with us as we walk day by day with the Lord of our life and the God of our salvation. There is nothing so beautiful as the heart that sees the power of God at work and which responds to God in praise and thanksgiving. That is exactly the kind of heart we see in Abraham. As I said on four different occasions, we are told that Abraham built an altar to worship God. But would we expect anything less from Abraham? 
After all, God spoke to Abraham. We do not know how, whether directly or in dreams or visions, but he definitely spoke to him. Once God, once God even appeared to Abraham in human form to tell Abraham all that was going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. And not, and not only did God talk with Abraham, he also made great promises to Abraham. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He's speaking to us. We who live by faith in Jesus Christ. God had big plans for Abraham. He made it very clear to Abraham that he was on Abraham's side and would be with him wherever he would go. With that kind of presence of God in his life, it seems only natural that Abraham should build those altars and give thanks to the Lord of his life and the God of his salvation. But friends, in Christ, it is not the altars that Abraham built that is important but rather what they symbolize. In building the altars, Abraham took time to acknowledge God who was the Lord of his life and the God of his salvation. God leads him to Shechem, and Abraham builds an altar to acknowledge God's gracious care. And later, when he camped near Bethel, he does the same thing. Note that each step of the journey of Abraham seems to give him reason to stop and worship God. He saw God's wonderful, gracious presence with him. And he simply had to give thanks to this great and wonderful God. So when was the last time that you built an altar to the Lord of your life? By that, I do not mean that you actually constructed or built some sort of table out of wood and stone. Rather, do you give more than a passing remembrance to the grace of God at work in your daily life? Perhaps we think it was proper for Abraham to do this, since God obviously blessed him so richly. But why do we need to build an altar? There is reason. We look at our lives and we realize that there are times when we have every reason to give thanks to God. We may drop everything to acknowledge God's goodness in that moment when some great potential disaster has been adverted, such as when we are driving down the 401 and just miss being involved in a major accident. But more often than not, we go through the day with nothing more than a passing thought to God's grace at work for our good, if we even acknowledge him at all. Do we even think about the fact that the God of Abraham is the same Lord who walks with us wherever we go so that our journey through life unfolds under the watchful eye of a loving Lord who is at work in all things for the good of his beloved children. We seem to forget that it is by the grace of God that we have those days when life seems to go on without a hint. We forget the God who is with us when we get a good job or when every light was green on our way to work in the morning, we were running late. Do we remember his presence with us in that fun day we had with our family 
or as the one helping us to get that work project finished on time. Unfortunately, we are more likely to criticize God for what we think he has not done than we are to acknowledge his gracious guidance day by day, moment by moment. And yet it is only by, by his grace that we even have each new day we enjoy. The Lord of our life is with us, ruling all things for our sake. And yes, yes, that applies even to those things that we see as terrible burdens. Even in those things we cannot understand, even in those circumstances when we want to question why God allows these things to happen, he is still doing what is best for us. And when we think of all that our God does do, from finding lost keys to helping us through that surgery, we realize that we have every reason to give thanks and praise to him whose love for us is so great that he is with us at every moment of our life. But the greatest reason to remember our God and rejoice in him throughout all of life is the very fact that he is the God of our salvation. Abraham built an altar that he might worship and praise God. But there was another reason why altars were built, to offer sacrifices for sin. On those altars, various animals were offered as sub substitution for the people. The death of these animals was a reminder of how horrible sin is and how great the cost of it is. And when we look at ourselves, we see that we are sinful people. People who not only forget God, but who often turn away from him to go our own way. But what sacrifice could we offer that would ever be enough? We would have to offer sacrifices and do nothing else. But even this would not be enough to pay the terrible death of sin we owe. But the God of our salvation shows his grace once again as he give us the perfect sacrifice. He give us himself in Jesus, in Jesus Christ. Jesus is offered, not on an altar, but on the cross, dying in the place of all sinners, including us, that we might have life in him. His sacrifice and his glorious victory over death assure us that God is concerned with more than just the things of this world. He has dealt with our eternal salvation as well. Yes, Abraham built an altar to worship the God who was with him on his journey. He remembered to praise the God who had blessed him, and he walked by faith with the God who had saved him from sin, death, and hell. We have, you and me, have every reason to build our altar too. As we go on our way through life, we will see with the eyes of faith that our God is with us to guide us and bless us. And in each remembrance of his blessings, we will find new and greater reasons to thank and praise, to serve and obey him. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue at this moment collecting the offering, and then I will read the cross-reference. The offering can come forward, please.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and mercy toward us, for sending Jesus Christ to die for our sins. And we thank you for everything that you have given us. We return to you a portion of what you have given us to be used in your kingdom. Amen. One of the original purposes for the Lutheran confessions was to respond to questions about what Lutherans believed, taught, and confessed regarding Christian doctrines. The apology of the Augsburg Confession addresses the teaching about the sufficiency of the sacrificial death of our Lord Jesus Christ in this way. We teach that the sacrifice of Christ dying on the cross has been enough for the sins of the whole world. There is no need for other sacrifices, although Christ's sacrifice were not enough for our sins. So people are justified not because of any other sacrifices, but because of this one sacrifice of Christ. If they believed that they have been redeemed by this sacrifice. For those who realize the price paid by Jesus on the cross to win salvation, the cross itself becomes a source of wonder and praise. That sense of holiness found in the cross is lyrically presented in the great Lenten hymn by John Bowring. In the cross of Christ, I glory. We sing that rise. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Jesus Christ and for all people according to their needs. We pray for all Christians around the world that as people united in faith <coughs> we may witness to the good news that is ours in Christ Jesus. Lord bless our learning and our worship and our questioning and our study and our witness as we grow in faith and devotion. O oh Lord, hear us for your sake. We pray for all nations of the earth, that in all places there may be times of lasting peace. We pray for people in lands where there have been upset and strife. And we pray for our own nation, that it may know safety and that people may be joyful in their daily lives. O oh Lord, We pray for all those whose labor serves us as we live out our lives under your watchful eye, especially those in the military, our police personnel, medical workers, and all those whose efforts support the common good. O oh Lord, hear us for your mercy's sake. We pray for the special concerns on our hearts today, including health and family needs, bringing to you our joys, our sorrows, and our hopes. We pray this morning for Linda, for Mary, for Wes, for Barb and Stu, for Lloyd and Elsie, for Mercia, for Shirley and Douglas, for Vicky, 
for Patricia, for Dorothy, for Trevor, for Remy, for Rebecca, for Gerda, for Sandra, for Sarah, for Melissa, for Karen, for Shirley, for Nancy, for Sarah, for Alice, for Marcia, for Janice, for Al, for Ed and Pam, for Rachel and her children, for Jason, for Barbara, for Walter and Donna, for Stan, for Becky, for Anna, for Delbert, for Dolores, for Grace, for Nancy, and Pastor Ron Moore. We pray also for those who are in our hearts and minds. Assure us that the sufferings of this present life are but transitory, and that your grace endures forever. O oh Lord, We pray for all the families of our congregations. Especially, we pray for Dolores, for John, for Susanna and Kristen, for David, for Michael and Marianne, that our Lord guard them from all harm and danger, and they continue shining the light of Christ to those around them. O oh Lord, hear us for your mercy's sake. We pray for those who celebrate their birthdays this week, especially for Brian, Madeline, Jason, Zach, Anne, and Niagoa, that our Lord continue blessing them as they trust that our Lord walks with them every day of their life. Also, we pray for those who celebrate their wedding anniversary. We remember Keith and Shirley, that our Lord strengthen their union and keep their love for each other till the end. O oh Lord, hear us for your main sake. We pray for those who labor in foreign mission fields, that God will protect them by his holy angels and strengthen their witness to his Son. O oh Lord, Heavenly Father, God of all comfort, it is your gracious will that your children on earth live together in harmony and peace. Defeat the plans of all those who would stir up violence and strife, war and bloodshed, and according to your will, and the current conflicts that now rages in Ukraine. Protect those who are suffering and being displaced from their homes. Bring a restoration of calm and security and heal the wounds that have been inflicted. O oh Lord, hear us for your mercy's sake. Join to the generations of the faithful. We remember all those who have completed their earthly journey in faith and now rest from their labors. Lord, inspire us by the witness of the faithful from all generations that we may complete our earthly journeys with confidence in your gracious promises as they did in their lifetimes. We beseech you, O oh Lord, hear us for your mercy's sake. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.